whatever the case might be. Uh, this is one of the two turbochargers that you will find on the N54 engine. Uh, it's obviously a twin turbo setup and uh, the two part numbers end with 170 and 171. Uh, this is the 171 as you can actually see on the, uh, the box, the part number on the Mitsubishi box. It's a Mitsubishi turbo. It's a TD025, TD025. It's really, really small in terms of the bearing system inside. Um, a lot of people like to upgrade or they are looking for an upgrade path on the N54 uh, TD025 turbochargers. They are really, really small. Um, and it's a bit of a point of contention. There's a bit of controversy surrounding the specific application and the specific turbo. And I'm going to go into that in this specific video. And I'm going to show you where the weak points are, why they are weak, and what risks, what risks you have when trying to upgrade these turbochargers or when running these upgraded turbochargers. So let's get into it. I'm going to uh, get some nice close-ups and stills on the actual turbocharger itself and I'm going to show you where the shortcomings are or where the challenges are in upgrading these turbochargers and why they actually uh, result in an unreliable setup. Alrighty guys, so this is the part number. So 49131-07171 and you get a 170. This is the actual turbocharger. It's a genuine Mitsubishi and it is really, really small. I mean, if you compare my hand, the size of my hand to the entire turbocharger with its manifold, uh, which is obviously stainless. This is a steel uh, uh, type manifold that has basically been welded onto the turbine housing. And uh, it's internally gated and often you'll find errors and problems where people are having to take the vehicles back or had to take the vehicles back for a recall when it came to the original N54 turbochargers and the actuator rattle. So what basically happens is the bush inside of this section of the casting actually starts to vibrate and it starts to fret. It's called plastic deformation, the metallurgical term. And it starts to generate a clearance and the actuator starts to become loose and you start losing boost pressure through the swing valve. And uh, obviously you can see this turbocharger in stock format, the swing valve is actually open. Now, when this is coupled together onto the vehicle and your vacuum line is connected to your actuator over here, um, it will, as soon as the ignition is switched on, it will draw a vacuum and it will actually close the swing valve. Now, the rattle occurs, or the, the error that you get with the rattle occurs when the vacuum is applied to the swing valve and is closed, um, the vehicle starts to drive and it leaks boost. It doesn't get the target boost that the ECU is programmed to look out for, and obviously you start getting a limp mode and uh, uh, error lights coming on, etc., etc. Um, that's just a little bit of info for you guys. Um, it's got nothing to do with the upgrades, but let's move on to the actual upgrade side of things. So the first challenge you have is people like to install larger compressors. Obviously, when they build a hybrid, they call them hybrids, and they basically go and take the compressor and they machine a larger compressor into the actual housing. Now, this housing, I mean, my hand is bigger than the housing and the actuator together. It is absolutely minute. So the flow capacity, the flow limit, I mean, this is my index finger. It's the same size as the outlet hole. You know, let's use my thumb, actually. My thumb blocks the entire outlet on the compressor housing. Do not expect a huge compressor or an oversized compressor wheel, if you can machine it into this housing, to be able to flow through this housing. The housing will choke it. So that's challenge number one. Number two is the wall thickness over here is approximately three and a half millimeters. So you don't have huge options in terms of larger compressors to machine into this housing because you'll machine this wall away and this is where your air intake pipe actually mounts via, via a clamp onto the uh, compressor housing inlet so that's number two number three you have almost no additional space to machine a larger diameter hole into the actual housing without cutting through this divider this divider is there for a reason it is there so that when the actual wastegate opens up, when it dumps, as you get to boost target, that the air coming out here, the discharge coming out of the actual turbine housing, 
regulating the boost pressure does not come into contact with the actual outlet or the vortex of the turbine wheel. It actually hits this little plate over here, gets redirected out of the downpipe. Now, if you go and machine some of this away, you're gonna land up having cracks and you're gonna basically compromise this little divider here and you will land up getting cracks and the cracks that will generate into this little section over here will start to propagate and, and spread and eventually you've got a cracked housing which if it contacts, uh, if it breaks through this little section over here from your swing valve outlet port to where the actual radius profile sits on your exducer, um, that will allow the, the housing to move and it'll make contact with the blade. So there is problem number two. Now while we're talking about all the, the shortcomings, we have another problem. The bearing system inside is absolutely minute and I'm going to show you one of those kits. I'm going to have a kit out, uh, laid out, I'm going to actually open the kit just now and I'll show you what the kit looks like, how big the thrust assembly is, um, the thrust collar, the thrust faces and look at the diameter of all of that uh, um, the load distribution area in the bearing system that is made available for the rotating assembly to thrust up against. Now once again, this is a journal bearing turbocharger, it has a limit in terms of the amount of thrust coefficient that it is able to handle before the size of the wheels and the thrust uh, loading of the size of the wheels are actually going to be able to overcome the bearing, start damaging the bearing. Once you've got axial and radial clearance, eventually your wheels are going to touch the end housings and you have a, have a catastrophic failure. So I'm going to go into that next. Um, once I've done that, I will tell you what the guys are doing. Um, some of the guys that are actually building these hybrids are using uh, TD04. So you go from TD025 to TD03 to TF035 to TD04. TF035 and TD04 are more or less the same size uh, thrust assembly. But it's, a, it's essentially two family sizes larger in terms of the thrust assembly. However, there are other challenges associated in terms of the bearing housing, which needs to be modified. The amount of work and the costs involved basically relate to an unviable financially upgrade for the N54s as compared to a single turbocharger upgrade or a bolt-on twin turbo ball bearing setup which will obviously allow you to make much more power, it will be a lot more reliable and you can run any boost pressure you want without having to worry about a thrust assembly failing on you. Alright guys, so here we have a TDO 025 and a TDO 4 bearing system. They look pretty much the same. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically just show you the comparison. They're the two journal bearing sets. TD025 on the left, TD04 on the right hand side. Clearly they're a little bit larger. The TD04 is larger than the TD025, as you can clearly see. However, we have another issue, which is the thrust assembly. Let's take the two thrust bearings and put them next to each other. So on the right hand side we have a TD04, on the left hand side we have the TF025, or TD025. These bearings are pretty much the same in terms of the outside dimensions. However, the thrust assembly, or the thrust pads, the thrust faces are completely different. Now, the easiest way to see that, without trying to angle the camera into light so you can actually see the thrust pads or the thrust faces, is just taking the thrust collars which mate up to those surfaces and we can put them next to each other. So there is a bit of a difference, it's not very substantial, it's not very big. The question is, are the thrust components in a TD04 bearing system able to handle the thrust coefficient or the thrust loading of the enlarged TD04 and often guys go for 18T um, and 16 T size compressors um, and, uh, and matching turbines? Well, the answer is not really because the boost pressures and the horsepower ratings that most people that upgrade the N54 turbochargers are aiming for are so high that you'd need to run two to two and a half bar boost pressure on these turbochargers and the thrust assembly with that, for that size rotating assembly will never ever be reliable. Now. I want to show you the TD025 bearing housing. That's the oil inlet, and that's just a Welsh plug for one of the water channels. And obviously, you've got your water in and out on the other side, and you have your oil drain over there. So let's go back to the oil feed. That's what I'm most concerned about. This has an O-ring with a fitting that basically pushes in 
to that area over there and it's got a little ear that sits off the side which basically takes a bolt holding that fitting into the actual bearing housing. Now the guys that use the TDO4 bearing housings to use as upgrades use this housing and this housing basically comes off what we would uh, uh, find on your diesel um, 2.8 litre Mitsubishi Pajeros and Mitsubishi Colts. Uh, you'll also find TDO4 bearing housings in a number of other applications. However, the bearing housing is exactly the same. Now, spot the problem. You would need to modify this bearing housing by welding a little ear on here that has thread in order to be able to accept that fitting. You're going to have to machine this open and your water channels are completely different. You have two on that side and two on that side. And then you will have a difference in terms of the diameter over here, which will fit into the turbine housing, and you'll need to machine the turbine housing to fit as well. Now, the problem is, I apologize, it's this side. The problem is, this specific housing utilizes flanges with bolts that hold it into the turbine housing. On the original turbo, it utilizes a V-band coupling. So there's more engineering to be had over there. And how the guys get around that is they actually machine this face off and they weld a stepped flange back onto this housing. Luckily, it is made from quite a high quality or high nickel content material. So you are able to weld onto it. But the amount of work, the, the, the point is the amount of work required to modify an N54 turbocharger to upgrade versus the costs. I mean, there's a company in the States um, that does this kind of upgrade and the price for this upgrade is substantial. It actually costs more than purchasing two ball bearing EFR turbochargers, for example, and bolting them on. Now, how that would basically be done, and the easiest way to do that would be take your stock turbocharger, leave the manifold in place, cut off the turbine housing, and then from there, either go from the two manifolds, a one and a one into, you know, your, your two manifolds, so two into one, and then have a little up pipe with a flange, V-band, T25, T4, T3, whatever your choice, and bolt on an EFR turbocharger as a single turbo option, which will obviously alleviate a lot more space inside of the uh, engine bay, and you'll have the best of both worlds. Two larger turbochargers take longer to spool than one slightly smaller turbo which is capable of flowing the same amount of horsepower as the two upgraded twins. There's less plumbing, there's less downpipes, there's less heat. It's so much more, uh, um, it's so much more simple. It's so much less complicated to do it in a single turbo setup. If you want to stay with your twin turbo setup, once again leave the manifold in place cut off the turbine housing, weld on a little up pipe or an adapter flange, or just weld a, a V-band flange directly onto the steel uh, manifold and mount a G25 or a, a slightly smaller Borg, a 6258 or whatever the case might be, in ball bearing fashion so you can run whatever boost pressure you want and you'll be able to make upwards of 800 horsepower capable if you screw that set up to its max. So that's a little bit of info on the bearing system and the shortcomings and what's actually required in order to modify these guys uh, to provide you with an upgrade. Yes, it's great because it's bolt on and you don't have to change the down pipes. Obviously, you're going to, you're going to change them for performance down pipes um, or decat them or whatever the case is. And you're not going to have to change the V-band flanges or the piping from the turbo to the cooler, etc., etc. But is it all worthwhile trying to maintain a bolt-on setup with a probable more than likely compromised thrust bearing setup where you're going to actually have a turbo failure, well, the choice is yours. I hope that's been informative. I hope you guys enjoy that. Give us some comments. Let us know uh, your thoughts and uh, interact down below. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and we'll catch you next time.